Hey everybody, welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today we have a really cool guest. Uh, his name is Michael Cooney, and he was the writer for the movie Alien Code. Welcome, Michael. Hey, how's it going, James? Thanks for having me. Sure, man. I'm I'm, I'm really happy you were able to come on and and you know take your time and and talk about uh, the movie. So for for people listening. I kind of like randomly found this movie. I, I, I believe it was on like Amazon Prime. And, um, you know, it's, it said alien code. So, okay. I, I, it was like clickbait, right? So, been awesomeness. <laughs> like, this is going to be great. Certainly well, high budget. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm like, okay, alien code. I said, let me see what this is about. And it said something about a cryptographer. I'm like, wow, that's actually sounds pretty cool. And I started watching it and, you know, yeah, you can tell kind of from the building, it's like from the beginning, it's like, uh, I guess, um, like uh, indie film or something. Yeah, it's low budget indie. Yeah, but it was really cool, man. And I I, I noticed the actor from somewhere. I didn't know where he was I'll, from. He's been, oh God, that guy's amazing. I love him. Uh, he's been in everything. Like he, he was in Veronica Mars, the TV series. He was the lead in Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Uh, he was- yeah. Haunting in Connecticut. He's done a bunch of horror. Um, he actually, I'm going to plug him here, he's going to be in the new Scream film coming out next January. Oh, no way. And I'm going to like remember him as the alien code guy now. Yeah. Um, but he's been all over. The, I mean, he was in, what was that one? American Sniper. Like this, yeah. this guy has been everywhere uh, and he's awesome. I love him. Yeah. Uh, for people uh, listening, uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have spoilers in here, man. So if you're listening to this, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave. I think there's a, also a, a freely available version on YouTube as well. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna post the link to that. So go watch the movie Alien Code uh, before you listen to the rest of this, unless you want to be spoiled like the 80 percent of other people who doesn't care anyways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nowadays, right? It's like yeah. that's. I'm like the opposite. I won't even watch a trailer anymore because they give too yeah. much away. And I'm, I, I don't want to know. I want to go in blind. I want to know nothing. Yeah. I'm a writer. Like I just, you know, screenwriter, you just figure it out. It's like, oh, okay, I'm you're seeing all the plot points that this is what's going to happen in the end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I, I just for on a side note, I had to watch the trailer for the Matrix 4. I had to, you know, oh. <laughs> had to, man. Okay, I did too. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's like some trailers you just have to watch, but I think that the, they're experienced enough where they're not, you know, they're they're purposely gonna do it the right way. You know? Yeah, because there's there's right ways and wrong ways, I guess. I mean, you're a writer, so you uh, you know this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I actually I worked with Keanu. I wrote his directorial debut, um, Man of Tai Chi. What? Yeah, this was years ago. You did that? Oh, but yeah, I saw that right when it came out because I love piano, man. What you saw, man? Uh, this yes. is, yeah, no, I wrote that. We, um, yeah, we filmed that in China. Uh, that's oh god, that was that's a that's a whole other interview. But that was an incredible experience just uh, shooting that thing. But I've known Keanu since, and you know, I just I want to know nothing about the Matrix Four. Not that he oh, would. I know, I know, I know, just the trailer. I yeah. dude, I, I love martial arts films and I love Keanu Reeves. So I was like wow. waiting for the movie to come out. And uh, yeah, it was awesome, man. Yeah. It's so crazy. The yeah, small world. Random. <laughs> yeah, but I'd like, I want to know, like, yeah, knowing people who've worked on it, I'm like, tell me nothing. I want to know nothing about the movie. Yes. Yeah. And then I go and watch the trailer like a dumbass and a hypocrite. But um, <laughs> I can't wait. So I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Anyway, so we're here to talk about aliens. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, not really. Mm, yeah. Right. We're here to talk about Alien Code, and you were you were the writer for the uh, for the film. Yeah. Um. So, you know, clearly, um, you know, it's called Alien Code. Do you have any comment on that? Yes, I do, and I already made fun of it when you introduced it. <laughs> right, bargain bin name. Um, I, I, the original title of the script was The Men, and I don't know whose decision it was. It certainly came after production, uh, probably in the distribution phase of things. Uh, somebody decided to change it to Alien Code. I had nothing to do with that. I completely <laughs> disagree with that title. Yeah. Uh, I think that suggests a certain type of film with a certain kind of content. It directly contradicts what the film is about and what the film is dealing with. Um, 
because really what we're dealing with are interdimensional beings as best we can understand them. But even that, I mean, it's all about perception, right? And how we perceive reality. So that's the best we can come to understand these entities that are interacting with main characters in the film. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, you could argue that they're alien because they're not from this planet or reality, right? But yeah, are you gonna call a movie about immigration, um, alien invasion? Uh, you know, and people are going to go in. They're not going to be expecting a film about immigration. They're going to go in and expect the film about like spaceships coming and Independence Day and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so I completely disagree with that title. I think it's cheesy and tacky and I don't like it. Um, I think it should be something more ambiguous like The Men. And maybe The Men isn't the best or most original title, uh, but I feel like it would just be broad enough that you could go in without any kind of expectations and just, you know, form your own opinions by the end of it. Yeah. And, you know, that's actually one of the reasons uh, that I invited you on here because I, you know, yeah, first of all, you know, again, spoiler alert, there's no aliens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, just, as, it, as, yeah, yeah it, as we would perceive, right. uh, you know, like the typical gray being and abductions and that, in that kind of sense. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, when I was watching the film, I really liked it because in, in, you know, from my perspective, it was like not just trying to do what everybody else was doing. I was like, wow, this is like an original idea. Um, and I really appreciate uh, like, you know, when somebody comes with an original idea, you can tell, you know, you can tell if an idea is, um, you know, inspired in a sense. So um, what, um, where, where were you coming from when when you were writing uh, the story? So I guess um, I've always been interested in aliens and ufology and all that stuff uh, ever since I was a kid. And I, I can't exactly trace back, you know, the moment where I first learned about UFOs and aliens and things like that. But I do remember hearing, I was listening to um, a radio station and it was late one night and, I, you know, you know this, I've already told you, but I was born and raised in Ireland. I came to the States when I was 18. So I was like this young Irish kid, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 years old in the countryside in Ireland, pitch black outside, listening to this radio station. And it was people calling in, talking about things they'd seen in the sky, talking about UFOs. And I mean, I was writing from a young age. I've been writing my whole life and that just tickled my imagination. I was, you know, I had known about UFOs before that, but this is one of the earliest memories where I really like became hopeful that I would see something and really just got super interested in it. And then from there, you know, the X-Files and I started buying uh, UFO magazines and all that stuff. So I've always been fascinated by and interested in that whole world. Um, then when I was in film school, I wrote a short, I had an idea uh, where, you know, I started trying to, as I do with anything, it's like, well, rationalize it. Like if, if this phenomenon were real, if it is real, uh, maybe a lot of them are hoaxes, maybe not, but what would it be? Is it really just little grays and this, or is it interdimensional beings or what is it? And how would they actually interact with us? Uh, we know so little about reality and existence. You know, we're just trying to uh, come up with ways, imagine way that, you know, we're just making things up and saying, this is what it is, but we could be completely wrong as human beings have been about reality throughout human history. We've been wrong about the shape of the earth. We've been wrong about science so many times and we just continue to grow and learn and relearn and just prove ourselves. Um, so it's like, well, what else could this be? And the idea for the short really was the idea that they're coming from a point, uh, an existence of non-linear time. Um, so how would they exist in our dimension of linear time? And the idea was basically they could exist in the same space as us, but just in a different time. So as is said in the film, 12 hours in the future, 12 hours in the past, when nobody's in the room, but they're looking through time to the point where you're in the room, right? So they're there, but just not at the same point in time as you, and they're just watching you and studying you. And that just opened up like a whole world of ideas. Um, so when it came to writing the feature, I knew it was gonna be low budget. And one thing I think that is the shortcoming 
or the downfall of most indies that try to compete, especially in sci-fi genre. They try to compete with the $50 million films and you can't by doing the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, you cannot compete with that. You have to acknowledge your budget, realize your restrictions. And when you have no money to do big VFX or anything like that, you really got to come hard with the ideas. So I came up, you know, I just started building out the ideas and, you know, have this unfurling mystery. Um, so I just brainstormed as many ideas um, as I could from taking it from building it from that original seed, right? Um, and that's how the script got developed. Uh, of course, I'm very much interested in philosophy and existentialism. So it's very heavily rooted in those, um, yeah. but also like very heavily leaning into science and science fiction uh, and quantum physics in particular, like everything I was building from a quantum uh, physics perspective, uh, just everything in there was, you know, just these things like superposition, um, and quantum entanglement like there are things in the script like i wanted uh the character of alex to be in, ex uh, in a state of uh superposition where he's both dead and alive at once right in yeah. quantum physics you have like a particle acting like a, a you know an atom or whatever acting like uh like a photon behaving like a wave and a particle at the same time and it's only once under observation it collapses into one state or one form which is an idea that you know, the man in the test rack scene at the end, he comments on that. It's like only once you make a decision does something like close down or if you think about something, your reality narrows down into one thing. It's like your thoughts that create your reality rather than your reality shaping your thoughts. Uh, so everything was built from almost like a quantum level, a quantum perspective, taking yeah. the principles of quantum physics and then building it into a narrative where the characters are actually just these particles or photons. Um, so I, I did a lot of research into quantum physics. I even flew out and I got into this um, this uh, crash course on, on quantum physics at um, JQI, the Joint Quantum Institute at UMD. So I flew out um, to Washington, went there for a week and got to hang out with all these uh, physicists and scientists and it was awesome. Uh, we did a bunch of experiments. Um, I got to see one of the ion chambers where uh, they trap a photon and you can actually look in and see this tiny, tiny particle, particle of light suspended in the chamber. It was like, to me, I was, I was on the moon, dude. Like this, it was, yeah. I'm such a geek. Um, but yeah, I, I did a bunch of research, um, wrote the script. Uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, yes, yeah, studied, looked up a bunch on quantum cryptography and what it would be in the future, how this message would get sent back. Um, so I tried to have it as legit as possible and then just fill the, fill the film, fill the script with ideas and just have it change as it progressed. Um, like you could really break the film down into two, two halves, I guess. The first is all ideas. The first half is all ideas. And then the second half is all thoughts. Like it becomes a very philosophical in the second half. But in the first one, it's all like you could literally take any one of those little sections and make a whole movie out of it. Like the idea of the thing coming back in time, this satellite, this message from the future, that could be the opening act of a big sci-fi blockbuster, right? Like that plot line could be its own thing. Uh, Beth, when she's in the observatory, like her observatory with her telescope talking about what if messages were coming across space and time like we study sound waves right look searching for messages from beyond the stars why aren't we doing the same with photons what if you capture photons and you find messages in the light that's traveling across the universe um and that's what she thought uh of course she ended up was going crazy and then she thought she was <laughs> uh, but that's what she was dying um but you know yeah. literally make a whole film about that in point of fact, I, there was there were ideas like I literally just finished um, another sci-fi script that kind of deals with photons. Um, that was an idea, a concept that came up while writing The Man, and I just finished it. It's a very different film. It's much bigger. It's definitely more mainstream. Uh, but the idea, like, they, there's just so many ideas in that film that could be their own thing. Um, but I really wanted to just cram them all in there, so it'd be hopefully interesting to people who are really hardcore sci-fi fans. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, that's, again, that's exactly what I appreciated. And then I, you know, I, uh, I didn't take a crash course in the quantum physics like you did, yeah. but I was, but I, I clearly was, you know, 
uh, picking up on like, okay, okay, yeah, that's like, that's a quantum kind of like theory stuff, you know, the, talking about, you know, the time and superposition and, and uh, the different dimensions and stuff. And I was just like, man, this is uh, really cool. I really like how that was, you know, portrayed in the movie and even um, like the character as he's figuring this out. Yeah. And uh, he, <laughs> it's, I mean, some of it is funny. I don't know if it's meant to be like, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, but I, I, I love movies like that. Just um, the way the guy was acting, like it was totally like, that's how a person would act, right? Like he's totally bugging out. Yeah, he's he not, doesn't believe like, it. He's like, this yeah. is crazy. What the fuck? And he's just getting more and more frustrated and angrier and angrier about everything. Uh, I wanted, I wanted, when I was writing that character, I wanted it to be humorous, um, but not putting jokes in there for the sake of it. Right. Or I make it funny. It was just naturally coming from his reactions to things. Uh, yeah. like even, even it's written in script, like when he sees the men in black for the first time, he's like, uh, <laughs> what the fuck? Um, <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. that. Yeah. Cause how else do you make that believable? Um, yeah. if you play it, like if it's played straight, it does not work. It, it becomes cheesy, yeah. right? It becomes right. Like, right. Yeah. If you were in reality, you know, if you were to see someone like that, you would double take in the street. Or just that yeah. you probably wouldn't let them in. Uh, but he was like, oh, they're just these freaks from a risk. Like, okay, fine. You're just here to yeah. check out on me. You guys look bizarre. You look stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I totally loved how raw the, the character was, man. He was just like, what the, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it had Dropping it. F-bombs. And that was, I thought that was great. Yeah, he's swearing all over the place. But yeah. Yeah. Um, because I knew, you know, it's like when I was writing, again, I was writing it to be an independent film um, and I wanted the strengths to come from the script. They had to. And there were a lot of decisions I knew, uh, like not everybody would be on board with. Like I wanted to, to be a little Kubrickian. So it's a, I, to, in order for it to succeed to any degree, I knew I had to have it stand apart from everything else coming out. It had to be different. And the differences were going to be its strength. Um, one of the things from any reviews I've read, like one of the things that has isolated a good chunk of people is the ending. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Which is fascinating to me because I've been to a couple of screenings. Uh, this is before, you know, like it ever got released or anything. There were kind of test screenings and there were people who came out livid, like so fucking angry yeah. that about <laughs> the film. Because it's like, there's nothing you can do. You're going to die. So just live. That's essentially what it is. I was, um, yeah. Uh, I, I was going to say, like, uh, just as a joke, like that, uh, you know, uh, you know, that the movie ruined my night, but in a good way, because I love, I love those kind of um, dichotomies, right? Yeah. I think it's like very rich in, in philosophy and, and almost actually in, in reality, in a way too, if you, if you, in a way you contemplate it. But it's, it, you know, I'm not telling the audience something they don't already know, but it's something yeah. that if they're that upset by it, they're hiding from it. So anytime somebody would like approach me and just be angry about it and they'd be like, I wasted two hours of my life because of this. And that's the message. Do nothing or like don't go back and try to change. I'm like, um, wow, I would laugh because I'm like, this person has they, they're in the middle of an existential crisis right now. And re they just got slapped with a dose of reality. It's like, yeah, that's life. Yeah, yeah. You think yeah. you're not going to die? <laughs> you think you're in control? Yeah. Um, which that's the whole Tesseract scene is kind of about that, like uh, reality versus perception and then just what you really are in control of. Um, like from a linear time perspective, you're not in control of getting a disease or getting hit by a bus. You're not in control yeah. of those things. But what you are in control of is how you like live your life. You're going to yeah. die, but you, you do have the choice. Like if you, uh, your frame of mind, Mind never matter, right? Your frame of mind can decide so many things for you. So that's yeah. just, you know, when you're on a uh, plane of linear time, that whole conversation yeah. is like 10 minutes long. And th I think that isolated a lot of people as well, because uh, there's just so much in there. Like if you're watching it, it's information overload. Uh, and I think half of it, your brain just shuts off and you're like, fuck, this is boring. Yeah. <laughs> Same with the drizzle. Well, uh, yeah. It was just like, I mean, it's deep. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, I, it's actually funny. I, I just created another uh, YouTube channel and podcast called Meta Perspective. Oh, like, nice! You know, going you know going meta, yeah. and um, and the uh, I, the symbol kind of thing I chose for the logo, I guess you can say, is a tesseract. 
Nice. And, you know, cause that's like a way of like, you know, going meta, you know, seeing things from a, you know, beyond almost like transcendental viewpoint. Yeah. Um, but uh, if, now it's probably, you probably, you might have not even done it intentionally, but a lot of those kind of philosophies are almost um, like uh, Buddhist in a sense. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I feel like the, you know, um, a lot of these philosophies you can trace back to, you know, you can trace them back to a lot of different places. Uh, yeah. Buddhism is like, you know, their thing is like inaction to reach enlightenment, um, you know, to be at one with the universe. I think that's a highly problematic worldview um, because if you're just going to sit down and do nothing, you're going to be a homeless person on the street uh, or essentially yeah. what are just and relying on the uh, virtue of others and the generosity of others to keep them alive and clothed and sheltered. Um, I, I think it's highly problematic. You get one life, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you know you can absolutely find uh, B- Buddhist philosophy in there. Uh, I do think the point at the end of the film is not like there are certain things you can change and certain things you can't. Uh, but you know, as he as Alex says to himself in the message. Um, forget and live you know yeah. uh, it's all about your thought process uh, like how you perceive the world like that can determine how how happy you can be how you want to yeah things and what projections you you yeah well again that's very that's kind of very zen yeah. um you know you, there is no doer meaning like you're not in control right and the middle way is acknowledging that and just yeah. going you know living in the present moment kind of thing right right um but so the men are, you know, if you were to see them and, you know, when you watch the film, you're going to see they're kind of, they kind of look like the men in black. Is that, that's inspiration for, for that whole, like where the look came from? Yeah. Um, you know, in the short that I wrote years and years ago, like the men in black visitation scene was always there. Um, and then I just, uh, because, um, and it's Driscoll describes this, you know, it's like we, we anthropomorphize them because our brain can't process what they really are, what they really look like. So we just perceive them as like these faceless men because it's all that our brain, it's our brains are incapable of seeing them as they actually exist. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, the, we're watching these characters scramble about trying to figure out a puzzle that they're, we're, they're just probably incapable of understanding completely regardless. Um, so yeah, we, I, you know, I can't do big monsters on a micro budget um, or a smaller budget. So I knew going in, it was like, I was going to keep it safe, um, keep it small, uh, justified that um, just using science or, you know, the philosophy that I was building within the film. Um, yeah, and rooted in ufology as well with the men in black. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Um, so the um, there's several points in, in the in the film where there's just like uh, again like these deep, really deep dialogues. Yeah, is that how you, is that how you wrote it, or did it come out in the acting that way, or? Oh no! Yeah, everything everything in the film is uh, was written, and even you know, the, there's there's stuff that was filmed that is not in the release. There's deleted scenes. There's a longer version, uh, but everything in the film, like all of that, was um, was as scripted. Uh, there's, I mean, Kyle generally like he's he's awesome, but he might have like changed a word here or there. Uh, he might've added another fuck or <laughs> this or that. Yeah. 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 He makes things his own, but the, in general, like, yeah, that all of the actors were pretty much just verbatim off the page, uh, which is an awesome thing to happen. Um, Graham Hamilton, he was one of the actors. He plays the, the man in all in black at the end. He was actually yeah. men in black, uh, in the interview. He was the one closer to Alex, uh, same actor, um he was fantastic he was just great he had everything off book um so yeah no that's as was written yeah i am yeah. not too sure if uh that dialogue or those scenes are really ones where you know you can ad lib <laughs> um i i think yeah. yeah you know if it was a comedy sure people show up and make up their own lines and uh, play around but this i think it would have been a disaster had anybody tried um so it was as scripted um which is always nice when you're the writer of something 
because you spend a long time, right? Like uh, crafting the lines and creating like the rhythm of dialogue, um, rereading, rewriting, uh, just, you know, it's nice when it just comes out the way you wrote it. Yeah. Now, and so, you know, you have, uh, I guess you can say they're interdimensional beings and they are, they are perceiving time differently and there's the dialogue and they're like trying to understand us in a way and they're explaining kind of um, how we, um, you know, perceive life or reality and, how, you know, we are the whole thing about choice yeah. and they're asking, you know, what was the whole thing about? Yeah. Like they're questioning, uh, like, why, you know, why do you do this? And they were asked, like, what was, what was kind of like the perspective you were coming from, from the questions that they were asking the human Alex? Really just my questions that I had, I, you know, and also my judgments of, on linear time, you know, they, they comment that it's so impractical and that we have to relearn pain and relearn this and relearn that because they were looking at us from generation to generation to generation. And every generation you start with, you know, with a new baby that knows nothing and has to learn all of these things then dies. And just, you know, it's just one step after another to evolve our species, our society to evolve all of it. And coming from a place of, uh, or nonlinear time where every, all of existence is just one moment. They look at that and think, wow, that's impractical. Um, so, I, I, you know, as hard as it is for us to imagine what nonlinear time would be like, I just thought, well, they're probably struggling the same as we would uh, looking at linear time and just like, well, what is a choice then? So you make a decision. Well, why do you make a decision? Like a choice would be a really hard thing because their, their outcome has already happened. It's already done. Everything is in existence in one moment. Um, so they don't understand choice. They don't understand the things that we do or why our, our existence is structured the way it is. It just doesn't seem to make sense to them. Uh, so I thought it would be fun, like if this whole film essentially is about that, they're reaching in and be like, this is an experiment. Um, they're studying us and trying to figure, trying to understand what linear time is and why we do the things we do. Um, why are there so, like it gets in the Tesseract scene as well, like the, the, he says to Alex, you know, with every person, there's a different reality. Um, you perceive the world in a wholly different way to what it could actually be, uh, or most certainly what it, it could be. We don't even, we don't understand the universe. We don't even know what dark matter is. We there's so much we're just incapable of knowing. Um, so with every person on the face of the planet, there's a different reality. Like how is that practical? Um, they just don't understand it. Like, why are there all these different realities? There should just be one. Um, so it's very hard for them to understand that, to understand why it's structured the way it is, why people do the things. But choice was a big one. And it starts off like in the very beginning with him choosing to sign the NDA. They're like, well, why yeah. did you sign it? Was it was it for money? Was it for altruistic reasons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. So they don't understand. And they're trying, they're asking him, it's like, why did you make that decision? He's like, what the fuck, guys? I I took a check. Why wouldn't I? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So they're, they're, they set up all of this because it's an experiment. They want to know why. And of course, like, there's a lot of ambiguity in the film. It's like, you know, you could argue that at one point in the film, he talks about it, the ant farm. He has the, he's like, well, maybe I'm not even on Earth. Maybe I'm in some, like, ant farm um, in like on some alien tape lab room table where you know ants in a non-farm they're in a glass case they don't have no idea that they're not out of nature right they're just going around building their colony doing their thing they have zero clue about the rest of the world or anything else going on but they're being watched and studied so he has that idea he's like looking out over the valley and the neighborhood and it's like well is that what i am is that where i am and he yeah. even ends that way right where he's looking out so there's like oh is is this even reality so there's a lot of ambiguity as well with that, but decision was a big one for them and all just from a nonlinear time perspective, like how are they trying to understand that? Yeah, man, I, I got a bunch of, <laughs> there's a bunch of questions I want to ask about the movie too. Yeah. Um, but I, I like, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, so the thing, and this is just a minor thing. And I wondered this, the, <laughs> the part about, uh, he has like the tumor, and and uh, well, they have the tumor, and when they have the tumor, they can perceive um, the beings, the yeah. the men. Yeah. So where did that come from? Um, 
<clears throat> that was, uh, were, was there any particular place that came from? No, that was like in brainstorming. I knew there had to be something different. I knew, okay. I knew that like about them, they had to be affected some way and um, they had to be affected some way in order for them to be able to see through the veil or start seeing through the veil. And I wanted that to be, you know, the closer they got to death, the more they could perceive. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, there's so many, like that's just exists in the zeitgeist, I guess, you know, people think yeah. closer to get to the, to death, they're more aware or might be able to see ghosts or things like that. Yeah. Uh, become more spiritual, what have you. So I wanted to take a sci-fi uh, approach to that. But yeah, it's literally the exposure to radiation. And also uh, Driscoll says at one point, it's like as solving a hard puzzle can give you a headache, like solving this uh, you know, message that they did in the lab, like literally get them a tumor. It was yeah, yeah. very metaphysical, but there were uh, physical side effects to the, the work that they were doing. Um, so, yeah, it was just part of the plot and part of constructing ways in which to, you know, get get them into this realm where they could see through the veil. Yeah. And so the, the part about the satellite now, I don't I don't. The ending part, I'm like, I'm like, oh, so sh sh wait, what happens then with um again this is a this is for anybody listening major spoiler go watch the film I think before you ruined it already. <laughs> yeah it's, it's been ruined 10 times but especially <laughs> this part the you know the satellite so the whole thing is like an experiment and they're watching humanity and they're these super advanced interdimensional beings that are basically to us in a sense omnipotent the way they can just see through time like we would consider that um you know omnipotent in a sense um so the what what is going to be the what's their effect overall on us at the end of the movie right like so the, the satellite sent he said there's nothing we can do it's the, they're going to crack the code and build the machine anyways but then like what happens when they build the machine like is all that going to where they were cluing in about it? this is going to start world war three and all that or was that um, not really. It's, you know, and again, it's like how much of it is set up to see what these characters will do. So how much of that is what their, the plot, how much of the plot in terms of their actions is going yeah. to have a real outcome, uh, because they, it just gets reset, right? Yeah. Um, well, that's what, okay. So that's, that's what my question was. So what happens? Um, well, like, it's, again, it, it comes back to decision, but with that, I mean, Driscoll in the cabin, he says like, okay, so this is the original, he was one of the founders of Avis, and he said the original satellite, you know, was like, it was like you're watching a VHS tape, he says, um, and you can, the first machine that they built was the remote, where you can rewind and forward and jump around. Um, this, and that's what they were using. They had the remote to, and to do that with our reality. And the second yeah is going to let them reach through the screen and interact. Yeah. So they could not interact. They were just observing. But this second machine, once activated, would allow them to be in this, uh, be in corporeal form, if you will, and just interact in our universe. Um, so that's essentially what would happen had that machine been built or if it were to be built in any one of these timelines. Um, because you have to imagine as well, like, has this happened before? Will it happen again? We're just yeah. you know, we're looking in here. By the way, they, and this is really weird and random, but the producers had me write a comic book. Um, like, and one of the first issue got published on the film's website. So uh, to give you a little bit more, um, in the version of the film that got released, this doesn't exist. It was filmed and it does, it exists in the script. They filmed the scenes, but the lead character has a brother. We find out throughout the course of the movie that his brother was killed in a school shooting. Um, it, that just leads into his character arc and also why he loses faith in humanity and doesn't even maybe want to stop this machine um, because he believes are people a thing worth saving. Um, and that's actually, yeah, that scene was cut from the film. I lament that. Um, they did shoot it. It's in a different version of the film, but um, it was scripted. Uh, in the comic book, and you can read this online. I'll find you a link. It's on the film's website. But um, they, you know, it basically, 
it start, picks up exactly from where the film leaves off, where he's standing, looking out over the valley. No way, yeah. Yeah, his neighborhood. And he goes home. Uh, I forget what happens throughout the course of it. It's been years, but his brother's still alive. So he comes home and his brother walks in the door. No way. It's like, oh, wow. shit. So then that's the end of the first issue. In the second issue, um, he's like, holy shit, what is going on? He goes back to the field where he buried himself. And there's like this overhead shot down on the field with all these dug holes and all these different bodies of his. Yeah. He's realizing, oh, this is not the first time this has happened. It's like, I buried, how many times have I buried myself? Look at like all he just digs yeah, up yeah, yeah, yeah. himself. So it kind of goes on. And then like in the third issue, like it's uh, it goes back in time. It goes back to stopping the first satellite with Driscoll. Um, so through these windows in time, it's like they have to send, you know, they can see right in the first film or in the film, you see him see back to Beth's story, right? So they can see through time. So they kind of use these windows in time to set, contact Driscoll back like 50, 60 years ago and give him a message to stop this first sabotage, the first satellite. So it's never built. Um, so there's like a whole, there could be a sequel. There's a whole extension, but the, the first issue of the comic book got uh, drawn, fully drawn, great artwork, by the way. Um, and it's published for free on the film's website. The second two issues uh, I've written, um, but they never got done. Uh, it was a very weird thing. I've never had that happen before where they were like, we're going to use this as a marketing tool. And then they cut out the scenes that have the comic book make sense. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. what, are, what are you guys doing? Like, that's not going to make yeah. sense. Anybody who reads that is going to be like, who's who's this brother? Who's what does this have to do with the movie? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so they're going to be scratching their heads on that one. But uh, if they watch this interview, then they'll know <laughs> um, yeah. that it does make sense. Um, but yeah, so coming back to your question, I went off on a tangent there. Um, what was your question? <laughs> it's like I totally went off. Well, like the... What happens with the satellite, right? Yeah, the satellite. So does that actually happen no matter what? And is there was there like a deterministic um, ending where like the satellite is going to... I mean, they made it sound, again, they were talking about, oh, the, the satellite is going to protect us against World War III. And, he's, and then the main character's like, no, it's going to start it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but they may, may they make it seem like existential where like this involvement with the satellite is like no matter what happens, like humanity's doomed almost. Yeah. Uh, and there's two like that's just how, again, you know, going back to saying you could take any section of that film and you could take that first act with the satellite and this is going to start the next war and you could have Independence Day style film. Um, there's not going to be a war like the event that's going to happen is they're going to be able to interact. And then as far as he's concerned, like they're doomed because then like, if this is the control they have over, over us, we're just being able to observe and slightly interact. What will happen? We'll just be a Petri dish. We will yeah. be an ant farm if we're not already and choice free will won't exist. Right. Uh, so it all coming back to that idea of choice. Um, so that's ultimately the event of like, if that machine starts, we're kind of doomed just because our existence isn't our own anymore. Yeah. 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 That's crazy, man. It's more of a <laughs> benefit. I mean, again, like it, it's not independence day. It's not um, satisfying to a lot of people, uh, but because it is a very philosophical climax to the film where it's just, you know, a conversation. Yeah, that's, I mean, again, that's what I appreciated about it, but I'm always like, th it got me thinking, and you know what I mean? Yeah. It got me thinking about all these things. Um, so <laughs> the, um, you said there could be a, a part two and there's comics and stuff. Do you think that there'll ever be, you know, more from, no. <laughs> but so you, you wrote it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of freedom to do anything with those characters or the, um, you know, no. I mean, the if you, like take the general idea and do something with it? I I would have to. I don't know who owns the rights at this point, but now. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's rights and all that. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, I don't um, know how stuff yeah, works. Yeah, it's it's all. Um, it's all fun stuff for creators. Like once you you know, I could write a script and sell it. Um, 
and then uh, maybe I'll get hired for a rewrite. Well, generally I'm a Writers Guild of America so uh, member, so I will get hired for a rewrite, uh, but then I could be replaced by 20 other writers and uh, my name might not even be on it at the end of the day. Uh, so the industry is a very strange place. Um, uh, it's not always the best for writers. You know, it's there's a great um, screenwriter, William Goldman. And he said, if you want to be a writer, do not italicize, hyphenate, put in bold, underline, like do not become a screenwriter. Do not work in Hollywood because it can, it as a writer, it's just your work is taken and you have no idea what it'll end up as. Um, I was like, you know, I was the only writer on this, which was very lucky. Man of Tai Chi, the same thing. Um, we spent five years on and off developing that and then two years production through production. And I was piano like happy, just was amazing. He had me on set at Video Village, like there pretty much almost every day. Um, I, you know, it, that's unheard of. It's unheard of. Uh, it's very rare when a writer gets to like be the only writer on board and have that much involvement. Um, because usually you're just kicked out or they don't want you around. Uh, so with this, the rights are gone. I don't know who owns them. If it came back around and they wanted to do something with it, they would actually have to come to me because it's under WGA contract. So they would have to, I would have to be the first writer. I would have to be given the first look if they wanted to do a sequel. Now, I, I don't think anything's going to happen with this. Um, I, I kind of, I was very surprised with how just, again, I'm not thrilled about the title, but just in terms of how it was marketed, like they didn't put it to any sci-fi film festivals, which I found very, very strange because that's where yeah. it arrived. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't think the film ever really had a chance uh, to find its audience. Um, and now it, it's weird. It seems to be finding some form of life online, uh, but in terms of profitability for the investors, I just don't think it will ever generate enough money to warrant further investment in the IP, in the intellectual property. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, like the comics, um, yeah, I mean, those are written. Those, you know, I did those, the first ones online. I can tell you, you know, I just told you where it kind of goes, you know, we get to the point in the third comic where it goes back, you know, we go back to the 60s or whatever first, uh, Driscoll and we're back in the Ares facility when it was first built um and he has to like do his thing um but yeah I, I'll have to pull those out because if you're interested because even the structure of like it was the first comic I've ever written so just even the layout and structure of that like it yeah I was gonna say that would have been a cool graphic novel man yeah I again the first one and the artwork is great um the first one is available online for free I'll find the link so you can just go directly there and yeah absolutely like share the other two with you i mean they're not actually published it's just the script um yeah comic book form so yeah if you were curious about where it could have gone or where and yeah i wouldn't really like i wouldn't personally i don't think it, i would ever write that as a script for a movie i don't think i think it would just be far better as a graphic novel or a limited series in comics i just don't think it would warrant being filmed um personally uh but yeah i think yeah yeah i think graphic novel would be cool yeah um you know i mean but yeah <laughs> yeah stranger things have happened um but yeah, yeah I got enough of a fan base to generate some interest oh maybe i have no idea i have no idea yeah, right now i don't think so though yeah um so now getting oh i just gotta ask it where did the tesseract come from the, the idea to have yeah, it as yeah. right. Well, I thought, yeah. you know, it had to be somewhere they couldn't fully exist in our dimension and he can certainly exist in there. So they had to have a meeting point. Um, and being in the Tesseract is killing Alex. Uh, he yeah. says, I can't be here. It's killing me. Uh, yeah. He's not supposed to be in that plane. Uh, so they have a limited amount of time to have this conversation. But it was really about finding a middle ground between both dimensions where they could, where these guys where this entity could extract whatever as much information from him as possible in that time period yeah yeah now um you know obviously you have a lot of really deep thinking and even you got the quantum physics thing going on um quantum mechanics how do, how do you think um this film relates to your your view of um like say the UFO subject in real life, right? Outside of the 
alien code or the men you out of that universe yeah um like what do you think of ufology i'll say yeah. like the ufo subject modern day oh yeah i'm totally with you um uh, it's a good question um because i would say the philosophy the philosophy in uh the film is very much my thinking I'd, like i'm of the mindset that we are just so primitive and so Okay, so, you know, there's the analogy, right? You take an earthworm, it doesn't have eyes. Uh, it, it, you could never explain, even if it had ears and a mouth, you could never explain to it what light was um, or color. It just wouldn't be able to understand. Uh, it doesn't have that sense. Now we have, I mean, we have five senses. There's technically more, like the ability to close your eyes and touch your nose, that's a sense. Uh, there's like 10, and I think the list is growing of senses that are now considered by science uh, for humans to possess. But, you know, we have, we have the five main senses. What other senses exist that we don't possess, that we couldn't, as much as an earthworm couldn't perceive color or light, what exists that we couldn't even imagine we, that we're just incapable of imagining because we, we just don't have the capacity to. So what else is out there? Even with the senses we do have, we're limited in. We know there are ultraviolet rays, but we can't see them. We know there are frequencies that exist but that we can't hear. So even in the senses that we do possess, we're very limited. Um, that's not even touching on the senses that exist undoubtedly there must be it would be arrogant to think that there are things out there that that exist that we can't perceive that we can't perceive right it would be arrogant for us to assume that we can like this is all there is and we're capable of experiencing life to its fullest or its existence to its fullest that is absolute nonsense we already know we're not uh, so there's undoubtedly so much out there happening just even in the space between me and this camera, there's like dark matter. There's all these things that we don't know what it is. We don't know what's in there. What yeah. the fuck? Like the most of the universe, we just don't understand. We don't know what's there. We don't know what it's doing. There could be all these realities in between us with no fucking clue. Yeah. And most of that is like, we're just incapable. We're just incapable of imagining it, of perceiving it. It's, we're just very primitive and limited. So when it comes to anything, once we get into science um, and once we get into phenomena like ufology and uh, lights in the sky, uh, different dimensions, I mean, I, we're, again, we're like an earthworm or a cockroach, uh, like the matrix is a line, right? Do you, have you ever stopped to explain yourself to a cockroach or something? Isn't that a line from the matrix? Am I making that up? Did I pull that out of my ass? He right said now? he said something else, but I, well, I don't think it was cockroach. It was, I think he used another trying to remember it's been it's been a while yeah. I actually i went back and rewatched the first one recently because i'm getting ready to do a uh, like a panel on the matrix on, nice. on my other channel nice uh which is good yeah i can't wait man because i'm so psyched um yeah, watched the trilogy last summer during lockdown i was like oh the matrix yeah, yeah. um i was like keanu's getting ready to shoot this uh so let me watch it and yeah, no, they're awesome. I love the philosophy. And just like it gets to that. It's funny because it gets to the end um, when he finally kills Agent Smith. His last blow is like, I made a choice. That was his line at the end. I was like, oh, my God, what a perfect line for that. Because yeah. um, it was all about free will and decision, which, the, you know, very similar, I guess, to the man, ultimately, in terms of uh, choice. Uh, but yeah, I was like, man, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, no, that's, uh, okay. But we, you know what I mean, right? It's like, yeah. you stop to explain yourself to a lesser being. Um, they're incapable of understanding. So when it comes to these phenomenon, uh, I'm very skeptical of anybody who says they have the answers and this is what this is. And that's that. Cause I think that ultimately is just a closed mind. Um, you yeah. can have theories and ideas. It's like, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. I believe it might be this, but I can't be that. That can't be the definitive answer, right? right. Um, yeah, because so we'd I, be defining under our terms, which right. don't actually in reality relate to the actual thing itself. Exactly. We can only describe our experiences as we experience them. Um, and I think that's perfectly great, right? Here's what I experienced. Um, I don't know what exactly it is, but it might have something to do with this phenomenon. It might not. 
Um, so I, I tend to keep a very open and broad mind. Uh, I, you know, in terms of UFOs, it's such a big arena as well because it goes from ships to lights in the sky to men in black to abductions. Uh, there are so many things, there's so many areas, and some of them they might all be the one thing, they might all be completely unrelated. Right. Uh, yeah. No maybe it is like maybe it's people coming back from the future in ships or from a different dimension or from a different galaxy. Maybe it's, you know, yeah, interdimensional beings. Maybe it's something coming from the inner verse, right? From the like, coming from dark matter. Like who yeah. the fuck knows? We yeah. <laughs> Um, and we can, you know, hypothesize all day long, uh, and it's good to do that because imagination is the the key to progress. And so we've, without imagination, we would have nothing. We wouldn't have science. We, you have to imagine things in order to take that step forward. So the conversations are important. Um, but I am very skeptical of a lot of things when it says this is this and that's it. It's like well, yeah. let's keep an open mind and let's have the conversations, but try to, you know acknowledge that it might not just be a little green man from another planet yeah uh, there's a million things it could be a million things that we can't even imagine the possibilities are infinite uh and yeah we can't comprehend that yeah we might not even have the language or lexicon to describe again what it actually is yeah or where it's from yeah um what do you what do you think about um contact you know and i'm saying that kind of in a general sense but you know, people like Jacques Vallée and others have noted it's, it seems like this phenomenon has been intentionally interacting with humanity mm -hmm. for a long time. What are your thoughts on that kind of paradigm? Um, again, I'm very open with that um, because the contact has been, you know, it's, a, it's another broad range, right? It's a spectrum. It's gone from like horrifically negative to positive, extremely positive. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to just succinctly like give one answer to that question yeah. because it is so broad. Um, again, like, I don't know is, you know, even the interactions, it's all about our perception of the interactions. You could see perhaps like lights in the sky for all you know, like that's on just the other side of an atom where they're firing fucking missiles trying to kill you. <laughs> You're like, what a beautiful light show. It's yeah, so yeah. Funny, you know, we can see something, perceive it completely inaccurately. Yeah, um, yeah. And then it's like you could have these other little fuckers like sticking probes up your ass and they're like, we, the prostate's up there. We thought you'd enjoy that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like you could have a negative experience where it's just they're trying to like reach out and connect and have a good time with you or for whatever reason they think they don't realize the pain they're inflicting or they certainly don't realize what's going to happen to you and the you know because of the stigma and the ostracization that might happen if you go public with your abduction um, and you know they have no idea no perception or comprehension of that and you know your life is destroyed but it certainly wasn't their intention they're like but we just want to give you a baby so we can you know have a hybrid yeah. uh is yeah. that a good thing um like you've no idea what intentions are and what perceptions are and what outcomes are as well like if these if any kind of conscious intelligent entity is reaching out how are they doing it and are there unexpected or unintended consequences of those interactions um so again like pretty lights in the sky could you know that's our percep perception of it right it's like yeah. it's it's like fireworks they're trying to kill you <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> uh or it, you know it's we have no idea we have no idea because even with the yeah. next Productions. There's so many stories where, like, there are some where there is that final moment where they meet them again and it's actually positive. Like, it was yeah. all frightening, and then it gets that one last encounter and it's actually cathartic. And, you know, it, it's just completely different to every other encounter. And it's almost like closure on the whole thing. And they see it all through a different light. For now, they're being friendly and there's, it's so, almost celebratory. Um, you know, where there is the hybrid human that they see right there or whatever. Uh, there are just so many stories that are different and conflicting. And I, it all comes down to, you know, perspective. Again, um, what are our perspectives of these things? And we cannot speak to the intentions of beings that we just are incapable of understanding. So we have no idea what's going on. I will absolutely assert that there is phenomenon happening. Um, 
And we could, at the very same time, we could be completely fucking wrong about all of it. It might not be aliens like from another planet. They might not be from a different dimension. They may, might not be time travelers. Maybe they're coming from the core of the fucking earth. Um, you know, yeah. it's like they're subterranean aliens or some shit. Or yeah, crypto terrestrials. Exactly. Living in Atlantis at the bottom of the Pacific. Um, yeah. Like they're, but we could be wrong about that as well. Because like I said earlier, how many things exist that we just can't even imagine, let alone comprehend? Um, so I definitely think there's phenomenon. There have been experiences. There's things going on. Um, I have no idea what they are, but I love imagining. You know, I love questioning. And I love, like, I've been interested in ufology since I was a kid. Um, I told you a story before, before we started this interview, like growing up in Ireland, one well, of my first memories of really having my imagination tickled and like starting to go down the rabbit hole, I was probably like nine or 10 years old and living in the countryside. It was late one night. I was listening to a radio show uh, where it was people calling in, talking about having seen their experiences, right, of uh, witnessing UFOs. And from there, I was just like, oh, my God, that's so cool. I want to see. I want to see one. I want to see one. Yeah. And then I just went off and became obsessed with the X-Files and I would buy those UFO magazines uh, with my pocket money and I just, just went down the rabbit hole with it and I've maintained that interest over the years though like the community has expanded into all kinds of areas in the past 20 years in particular it's really just opened up to psychic connections and all of these other things that weren't being discussed as much as much uh, back in say the 90s and into the 2000s but it's really it's, even the past 10 years I feel like you know, you have all these things that just weren't really being done before or investigated as much before. So it's still really exciting. I'm not as involved as I used to be because that is something that is really consuming. Once you once you yes, enter that yeah. world, it just envelops you. Um, I personally don't have the luxury of time to, you know, participate in everything that's going on, but I still touch in certainly with our friend or mutual friend, Ruben Langdon, he will catch me up whenever we hang out. Uh, and God knows those conversations go on for hours. Um, yeah. and they're very, very informative. Um, he's actually a good person to learn from because he will go explain something for two hours and then wrap it up with and of course it could all just be nonsense and i'm crazy but <laughs> this is what i believe <laughs> yeah ruben he's a great guy man he's You're a great right. dude he's awesome and uh yeah and you know again he i actually um i interviewed him here uh, a few months ago nice. and i i had no idea right so i i've been taught i was talking back and forth with him and then during the interview he's like yeah and at in 2010 i was at the c SETI event and i was like dude i was there too that's so awesome. we were at the same event and we probably had met each other and didn't even you know no yeah so that is so cool yeah. um do you are you aware of kind of what's going on now uh in the media with uh you know ufos and kind of disclosure where um the pentagon has uh, officially acknowledged uap is what they're calling it yeah, I, I think, you know, honestly, it's it's uh, there's a lot of nothing, really. They acknowledge, but we all knew and they they they're not saying it's extraterrestrials. They're just saying this phenomenon exists. So I think it's like a really soft land of a soft release of information. Um, it, to me, it's I, I know a lot of people are excited about it, but until they say, look what we have from Area 51, guys, look what we found in Roswell until there's like something like that. I'm like, guys, catch up. Canada has done this like everybody else has done this. What are you doing? Come on. Yeah. Like, it took them how long to get to this point? So, yeah, I, I do get the excitement around it. But when, you know, that was released, that report, I found it completely underwhelming. Yeah, personally. Um, and you know, I don't know what they know. I don't know what they have. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if like they were in constant communication with some other form of being, um, certainly a lot of people have stepped forward and said that is the case. Um, but they're not releasing that information because of the chaos that might ensue. I, I think one of the biggest problems would be ideological systems. Uh, because if you yeah. do something like that, it's going to shake the whole foundation. Um, I think, you know, what, how will society react? And maybe they're doing it to protect society. Um, I have no idea. Uh, but I found that release very, very underwhelming. 
especially with yeah, like yeah. some of the footage they're releasing. It's like, come on, guys. Yeah, you got to have some theories here, you know? Because, yeah, yeah. You know, national threat. Like, I'm sure you're telling me the, 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 you know, the, they're not looking into this. It's like ships that can do things that we we can't even figure out how. Technology that yeah. shouldn't exist. It's like, you're, come on, come on. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I, I think for me, it's like a whole lot of nothing coming from the government. They got to do a lot better than that. Yeah, no, I... Um... I'm doing something in a few weeks called Crash Retrieval Week, and a bunch of creators are all going to focus on a Crash Retrieval case and awareness, and you know, it's going to be a cool um, kind of week. But nice. um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? It's like, what what do you think would happen, like literally, if if uh, say the U.S. government, as an example, said, you know, uh, you know, Roswell was real it was an alien or you know non-human craft we had it in our possession what do you think the public reaction would be like scientific community and all that i i think i, I think it would depend on what other information would, would be released like because looking back and saying this happened what 80 years ago now 70 80 years ago yeah uh, is one thing but where are we today like what has happened since where did we the technology to develop cell phones or whatever the fuck um where are we today and what does that mean for now and for the future i think that's what most people are going to be interested in in terms of how would it change things i um unless aliens were going to start popping up if uh, you know around i i'm not too sure how much daily life would change because most people are just going through their day trying to get through their lives, I think, ultimately. Um, I'm not too sure, like, I think you will have set congregations like flip out and reject it. I think there will, there will be things uh, where groups of people will be upset and groups of people will be excited. Uh, and groups of people, you know, will be indifferent. I, I think the world would keep turning, um, but it would all depend on how daily life would change for most people. Um, because you're still going to have to get up tomorrow and go to work and pay your bills. Like, this is the thing, like, I think it's a lot of people will say the world will stop, the people will be freaking out. I just don't think that's a realistic expectation of what would happen. I do think for ideological systems, it would be, um, it would shake the foundation, uh, you know, it would shake their foundation. So that would ripple into the Catholic church or whatever belief system you have. Um, but how much uh, how, is it going to be dismissed at first? Like, what are going to be the everyday implications of that? So acknowledging that a ship did come here and crash, people who don't want to believe it are not going to believe it. Uh, people who do, you know, it, it just, that's one thing. What's going to happen right now? Are you in contact with these aliens? Are they going to appear on TV and do press conferences with you? Are they, you know, it, it's really about where are we now and what's going to happen next? Yeah. Uh, do you do you think there'd be like an innovation in science or even scientific thinking that like now that they know that this is possible? Yeah. That it would create a kind of shift in, in thinking. Absolutely. I, 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 well, it would depend on the technology that would be shared with us. Right. So it would depend on the technology first. Um, and then I think there would be really important questions of how quickly do we want to implement this technology into society. Technology is already evolving faster than we are, and we can't keep up with it. Just look at what's happening with social media. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to police that um, and the rifts it's causing in society, just how it's changing people and their thought processes. Uh, it's definitely evolving faster than we are, like I said. Uh, so what other technologies exist like that we are just not ready to yield yeah so yeah. that would be a very important question as well um like can we use that because what weapons could it be used for like there's no technology, <laughs> right yeah. uh, who gets that technology you know if you give it to you know if, if it goes over to russia what's what's going to happen <laughs> you know if yeah. it goes to the united states what's going to happen um if it goes to a superpower or like who knows what like hell they could go to ireland right my home country <laughs> like, if they give them all the alien technology and ireland's gonna be like hey let's go to let's get drunk guys <laughs> <laughs> like if suddenly you have this tiny island become a superpower uh, but would it do the right thing would it uh and then people invade like it's you have no idea what would happen with that much power and how it would be 
I don't know, like spread throughout the world and shared and what it would be used for. Um, yeah, there would absolutely be groundbreaking strides made in science and technology, but we have no idea what those would be until we knew what kind of technology we were being given. Uh, maybe, you know, you could also yeah. have a conversation. You could talk about, well, maybe that's why they're not interacting with us or sharing things with us because they feel we're not ready yet. Um, and maybe they're, you know, giving us a little bit every now and again, or maybe they're just watching us evolve at our own pace and monitoring. Um, again, this is all, you know, hypothetical and it, it, probably completely wrong because it's probably something <laughs> completely else going on. But yeah. it, it's fun to have that thought and question it. Um, I mean, you could write a whole script about that, right? You could tell a whole, or write a whole book about it, just getting a bunch of technology and then watching the people like fuck it up. Basically, I, Dude, I would do it, do it, make uh, that your next one, man. Make a very, very, very dark comedy <laughs> um, that's <laughs> global and what each country does. And, you know, it's like you'd have one stoner scientist like creating all these fucking. Yeah drugs and like it should i don't know it's like there's a million ways that could go it'd be like mars attacks except with uh just technology no aliens they're like here you go guys <laughs> have fun yeah. um but yeah it's like yeah i i love sci-fi and like i said i just wrote one that deals with photons it's like the premise of the script is like set 20 years in the future and it's it's more about like you know, metaphysical threat to Earth. It's like basically an Enom Musk character creates, um, he puts his team together and they have figured out a way to spend space time. So they send a probe through to the edge of the observable universe to take pictures of what lies beyond further than we've ever seen before. And then basically what comes back is it's a thriller. It's kind of high budget, but that's the impetus of it. Uh, and it really deals with perspective as well, but also just you know, speaking of photons being a threat, it's like there's that version. Um, weaponized photons is essentially what it's about. Um, then, like, I'm just writing another one right now where, oh, Jesus, we've we'll been going on all day about the sci fi scripts I have and just the yeah, different yeah. threats that could exist and just our interaction with things. Um, there's a billion ways you can imagine these things and their outcomes, whether it's yeah. technology or whatnot. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, like in terms of the alien invasion thing coming down and blowing cities up, I think that's like the least likely of all outcomes. Uh, they don't have to do much. You know, they can just give us one piece of technology and watch us go. And that would be yeah. it. Um, or else just, yeah, there's so many things like, again, photons. It's like they don't even have to lift a finger. Um, they can fuck with sound waves and kill us all off. Uh, you know, if they if that's what they wanted, there's so many metaphysical threats um, that we just never even think of that, you know, that if they were able to do the things they're able to do and they're of a higher consciousness, it's like very easy for them to do these things um, yeah, yeah. in terms of the threat they pose to us and yeah, technology, who knows what we would do. It's like, it's I'm just going off on different ideas right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going off on a tangent. But yeah, there's a uh, we don't know. That's always where, yeah. where I go. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, it's, it's been great talking with you, Mike. Um, I definitely, I, I probably got to have you over on my, uh, my other channel meta perspective, just to talk about some of the philosophy stuff. Cause yeah, absolutely. you know, I love that stuff. Um, and I, on there, I, I want to ask you about simulation hypothesis Okay. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, but, uh, do you have any parting words for the audience the about audience. the men, about, uh, you know, UFOs in general, about reality? Oh, just keep an open mind. Uh, yeah. Whatever answers are out there, we're probably never going to have them. But you know what? It's a fun ride. So we can at least try to experience life to the fullest, keeping an open mind and just soak it all up. Um, just keep an open mind. Whatever you hear from people, what they've seen, that's their experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. There's a yeah. lot out there that we don't understand. So I don't know. Keep your ear to the ground and your eyes to the sky. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna end it here, but I'm gonna ask you one more question off air. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks, James. Thanks, man.